Hello everyone, welcome to my 1cc commentary for Cotton on the Nintendo Switch. I am playing the Reboot Arrange version. This is actually going to be really interesting to check out. Originally, I was going to go for the PS4 version as I typically buy new shmups and console shmups on PS4 rather than on Switch, mostly because of input lag issues and being able to use my arcade stick effectively and all that. However, the reason why I decided to go for the Switch version was actually two reasons. The first was that Shmup Junkie messaged me and told me, hey, the input lag on the Switch version is actually really low. So I checked it out and on my setup, I got it down to three frames of input lag, which is actually really impressive for a Switch release. This is the lowest Switch Shmup input lag I have ever seen outside of something like using RetroArch with Run Ahead. So for that reason, I was like, hey, that's really cool. I want to check that out. The other reason is because this is a horizontal shmup and I found that if I want to play shmups in handheld mode and that's about 90% of the usage of my switch is as a handheld I think horizontal shmups just suit it much better than vertical shmups as much as I like vertical shmups the reason being is that even though this flip grip is a cool idea and it can work for some games maybe like a demon's tilt the pinball game I find it isn't that effective for shmups because playing shmups on the stock Joy-Cons is an absolute nightmare no matter how you slice it. And for a long time I've tried this. I actually was an original backer of the Flip Grip, so I've had the Flip Grip since it was released. And I've used it over the years many times and oh boy have I put a lot of effort into trying to make it work. But in the end I just can't for two reasons. The first being is that the stock Joy-Con D-pad is just a nightmare. Even if you do that case mod, which I did, it still doesn't really function that well because the buttons stick out too high, and so you can get really weird diagonal inputs. It's actually kind of stiff and weird. You actually can also get opposing direction inputs at times when you're not meaning to. It's just a nightmare. And then this other problem is even if you make peace with that, these small Joy-Cons with the flip grip turn my hand numb in about an hour. I can only play for about an hour then my fingers and hand go numb because of the small size of the buttons and the kind of weird way you hold it. And so whenever I play shmups on the Nintendo Switch in handheld mode, my configuration is on the left side I have the Hori Joy-Con which is similar to the Joy-Con except it has a real D-pad and actually a really nice one. And then on the right side I use the Split Pad Pro by Hori as well just for that extra sort of hand space and also to prevent my hands from going numb. So I think that combination is definitely the way to play the Switch and is more suited to stuff like Cotton or Rolling Gunner, you know, horizontal shmups. So for all those reasons, I decided to get the Switch version and I thought you'd all be interested in checking that out anyway. Down the line, I might pick up the PS4 version. But with all that said, let's talk about the game itself a little bit. So I am somewhat familiar with the original release of Cotton, or I guess the original PS1 port of Cotton, because for a while there, what ended up happening is I modded my PS2 to play burned PS1 games. <gasps> yeah, I admit it. For the reason of playing Dodonpachi on my PS2, because I was thinking, well, maybe if I play it on the PS2 rather than playing it on emulator, you know, the PS1 version, it might run a little better. You know, it might have more accurate slowdown and all that sort of stuff. Maybe the problem is just PS1 emulation sucks. So I went ahead and spent all this time and effort doing that. And then what ended up happening is that the PS1 version of Donopachi is not good. Even when you do uh, correctly get everything running, it just doesn't work all that well. I have a whole video about this anyway. So then I thought, okay, well, I put all this effort into making the PS2 work and to play games. So I went through a brief period of playing all these PS1 shmups I think I'm going to return to that pretty soon with some like Ray, Ray Crisis or what Ray Storm, whatever it is. Not Ray Crisis, Ray Storm. There, I want to get into more PS1 shmups here soon. But one of them was the Cotton version of PS1. So I played that a tiny little bit, never really dunk, uh, sunk my teeth too deep into it. But I do like a lot of things about Cotton just from the outset, even without playing the game that much. For one, I really like the visual style of the game, both this reboot and also the original. It has that sort of Death Smiles feel to it, you know, it's like kind of a little bit gothic, but also kind of cute at the same time. I really like that combo a lot. And also I like the main character of being a witch on a broom. For whatever reason, maybe watching too much Kiki's delivery service growing up, whatever it is, I'm a big fan of characters that are on uh, brooms, witches on brooms. Some of my favorite shmup characters, like uh, Marion and Gumbird and stuff like that. So for those reasons, I was really initially interested in the game for the visuals. 
But also, I really like the way the game felt. You know, the original version I'm talking about, where it had a little bit of like a... I don't know what... It's hard to describe, but it has almost like a little bit of a RPG-style system to it or something with the, the power-ups and the way you use your power-ups and stuff. I don't know. I, it was really working for me. But I hadn't really dug into it all that much. So I thought, hey, let's get this reboot. Let's check it out. And I have to say, I'm going to make a whole video about this. But I am impressed with the updated visuals of the reboot version. I'm making a video here about how a lot of remakes and remasters and reboots, the initial premise of them is to get better visuals, right? Like that's sort of the whole point of them. And I'm a big fan of that idea and concept. However, a lot of reboots and re-releases we see coming out actually look significantly worse than the original versions, at least in my opinion. So for me, I'm always in a little bit of a, I'm trying to ex find the right word for it, naysayer, I guess, kind of position when these things come out. Because, you know what I mean? I'm not trying to be a hipster or anything, but if the original game looks better than the re-release, I will always play the original game. I'm very all about the visuals. I've talked about this in a few videos. And so if the visuals aren't there, I'm just not gonna play the game. Even if the game plays okay-ish, the thing is, is that there's the original version with, you know, the better visuals and I'm sure the gameplay is similar or sometimes they also make the gameplay worse in the remakes. You know, they try and streamline it and modernize it. But they end up making it crappy. I think the, what is it? The uh, Panzer Dragoon remake checks all these boxes for me. I'm not a fan of that. I think the visuals look like a ugly Pixar stale sort of cheap 3D sort of look. I really don't like that stuff. Also, I think the, the gameplay itself also suffers significantly compared to the original version. So there's kind of an example of what I'm talking about of, on both fronts. I don't like it. Other, Well, I don't want to get into this too much because I have a whole video about that. But anyway, I'm happy to say that this reboot does not fall into that category because I absolutely love the way they did the visuals here. Where it has this sort of saturated... 3D look to it, but it also has a sort of um, underlying pixel art too, where it feels like you're playing a souped up Neo Geo or something like that. And I really like that. So it is it, a, it is able to avoid that issue of having that stale, cheap 3D look that looks like a nightmare. I think there was an R-Type re-release or something not too long ago that fell into this category. Just, I hate that stuff, but this looks like the, uh, the person took a lot of care, or the team took a lot of care to make this faithful to what the graphics were supposed to look like and it reminds me a ton of death smiles i kind of think that was a big point of inspiration for this game's re-release redone visuals is death smiles and i think you couldn't find a better source of inspiration death smiles is one of my favorite shmups visually speaking uh that has that sort of graphical dark but also cute gothic it's got it all and I just, it's hard to exactly articulate, but I'm a big fan of the visuals in this game. And just looking at this stage, for example, look at the background. They put some care and work into the backgrounds. They got different uh, layers there. The clouds are scrolling up there. The backgrounds are scrolling. You've seen a lot of remasters. Something they really fall up on is, sure, they'll add some kind of fancy looking backgrounds, but they don't do any work into like background animations or like, for instance, I remember I was playing, I can't remember what shmup it was, but it was some sort of like Euro shmup 3D re-release and the backgrounds looked you know technically okay but they were all completely static so it's like you're just flying in front of a painting rather than flying around in a galaxy and stuff i think this game does a good job of recognizing how important the background art is and just looks absolutely fantastic so graphically i'm a big fan i did enjoy the soundtrack quite a bit unfortunately as i do my commentary here i can't hear what the soundtrack sounds like so I might be a little bit um, hazy on the details, but I do remember enjoying it quite a bit. I think one thing, speaking of the visuals, that's going to be a point of concern for a lot of people for this mode specifically, is whenever you go into fever mode, which is essentially your hyper, you'll end up racking up these tons of points and you'll get these giant hit counters as you see them right here. This is a perfect example. But as you get further in the game, it gets so visually chaotic that you actually cannot see the bullets all that well they sort of get buried in with the background effects and the sort of um reward system for when you're in hyper i think they're obviously inspired by something like crimson clover which does this i think the idea is perfectly fine all they need to do is they need to go in and sort of touch up the coloring or something like that maybe make these numbers and stuff a little bit more transparent 
or add just some real, real thick lines around the bullets or something. I don't know. I think it could be pretty easily fixed if they went in there and just touched up the visuals a bit. Again, made those a little bit more transparent or brought them a little bit further back in the layers. I don't know what exactly, but there's something can be done, I am sure. Because Crimson Clover has proven you can cover the screen and stuff and still make the bullets visually accessible. You just gotta really think about how you're gonna do it. I think that's gonna be a common point of criticism, and I think it's valid. I think it could be fixed though, so hopefully they go ahead and do that. My biggest point of criticism for this release is actually something that would also be pretty simple to fix, though I'm not sure if they actually will, which is that there is no stage select for whatever reason. Um, they seem to have gotten everything else in there, but they forgot to do the stage select or training mode. So when I was going for this 1cc, I literally just had to grind the game old school style, right? Um, just do run after run, try and experiment in different areas and all that sort of thing. What's funny is I had, before this run, I had two runs where I was very close to the 1cc, but died one extent early. So I was one extent away from the 1cc. You'll see how this run goes, but um, yeah, it, it all came together in this run. And that's kind of how it works when you're having to do this sort of method of learning a game, is you basically sort of learn the game all at once. So you'll just do run after run after run. And it seems like you're not really making all that much progress, but then the pieces start to fall in place. And then all of a sudden you're just steamrolling through the game. That's kind of what it went here. The biggest problem for me was I wasn't familiar with the system of the game. That's where I was running into the most trouble is I just was not familiar with how the game works, what it wants you to do, what it wants you to go for. So I'll try my best here to kind of explain the, ba the basic method if you're playing for survival anyway. So what you want to do is you want to keep an eye on your little magic uh, items. They're in the right there. So the one that's glowing green, that's the current active magic item. And you actually have a button dedicated to them called the magic button. If you press the magic button, you basically just do a sort of panic bomb style screen clear attack. Usually not all that powerful. Uh, depending on the situation, some of them seem to be pretty powerful. But usually that's something you want to do to get a little bit of invulnerability, get yourself out of a tight corner. But it's not necessarily that strategically advantageous for the most part, depending on the situation. Or what you can do is you can hold your magic button and charge it. And once you charge it, you release a different attack. It's like Mega Man X, right? Like in Mega Man X, when you power up all the way into pink and then you fire, you'll get like a different sort of fire and usually it's really cool. That's how it works in this. And some of them are just really, really good and useful, especially the blue one. So if you're playing for survival, blue is your friend because what blue does is it activates a force field around you, Sonic style. And that force field absorbs damage for you. I think you can deal damage with it. I'm not entirely sure, but it sort of seems that way. And so, like, here I am right now. I have it on. Very, very, very useful. Keeps you safe. So what you will kind of want to do is you kind of want to sort of do this little farming method, which I figured out in this run where you play aggressively, you pick up the blue, you charge it, you release the shield, then you play aggressively again, pick up another blue, rinse and repeat, in the meantime, you're going to get a variety of the other magic items. I'll give you kind of my thoughts on them because it is pretty important how they work. The green one, I am not entirely sure what a powered up green one does. The immediate green gives you a screen clearing bomb, which is really nice where you drop rocks down. I think I'll do it here in a second. Here it is. Yeah. Drop the rocks down. That's actually really useful. You're not in totally invulnerable throughout the whole thing, though, just to warn you. For some reason, I thought I was initially, and I kept getting killed. Then I was, oh, you just get, you know, vol on the startup. Other than that, you gotta really play. Oh, here is a really great section. Hold on, I'll get back to the other stuff. This is a great section because here I gotta really play. I can't. I don't have a force field anymore. I just had to do some old school style uh, shmup in there. But basically, if you want to do well in Cotton and get the one CC or the arranged version, what you want to do is you want to abuse the magic system like there's no tomorrow. Another thing is uh, the fire is really, really good. So if you get fire, fully charge that up and unleash it. And basically what you'll get is you'll get these uh, homing fire options that do a ton of damage, uh, give you a lot of screen coverage. They're very, very good. So in the order of items, my favorites, blue, definitely the best. Then red fire, probably. Green, I'm not entirely sure what it does. I keep forgetting. Um, the screen clearing bomb's really nice, but the fully powered up version, I think it boost your shot or something. I don't. I can't remember quite what it does, but it, I think it's okay-ish. And then the purple one's weird, where 
If you fully charge it, you basically convert all the gems to purple and they fly to you, which I assume is good for your score. Not all that good for survival. Or if you're in the just a level one where you just press a magic, you'll drop this powerful bomb thing, but it has limited range. But uh, I use it effectively on the next boss. So the purple, I think, is probably my least favorite item. Though you seem, I seem to get it a lot, so I kind of did have to learn how to use it, at least somewhat well. So the other major mechanic of this mode that I need to cover, well, there's two more. The, uh, the first one I want to get to is these gems, because how these work is going to be confusing right at first, so I'm going to try and help you. So when you shoot the gems, as you'll see, you get this sort of fork coming out of them. That fork is actually your own shot, and it's really good. So what you want to do most of the time is you want to shoot the gem, so you can get that fork of a shot there and you get a lot of screen coverage it does a lot of damage it also builds your meter so that's very very good however if you shoot the same gem too long it turns dark purple and then becomes sort of a barrier and you have to pick it up otherwise you're just going to have your bullet stopped by this dark purple bullet or dark purple crystal so the sort of uh, meta of all of this is that you sort of um collect them and move forward you don't want them to become too stale but if you're going for score you kind of want to turn them purple and collect them i think that's the way you do it but if you end up uh the game does a lot of luring though so don't mindlessly chase after those gems and don't just collect them right away you want to leave them on screen and shoot them to get the to get the fork effect like as you see here and then what on the meter that's the other mechanic i want to cover the fever meter, this is your hyper basically. This is like your break in Crimson Clover, something along those lines. Very, very powerful. I don't think it raises rank. At first I was sort of being stingy with it because I thought maybe it raises rank or something. I don't see any evidence of that. It could be doing it, but I don't really see any evidence of it. So basically you want to use it very freely because that's how you gain you know, the majority of your points. You know, just like in most shmups with hypers and breaks and that sort of stuff. It also gives you a little bit of invulnerability upon activation. That's very useful in boss fights and stuff. And uh, some tricky sections like this, there'll be times where you want to just hang on to it and then use it strategically along with your bombs for invulnerability. So this game gives you a lot of toys to play with. And I think if you're more used to a cave style shmup or something like that where you're expected for the most part just to shoot and dodge and not really use a lot of items, this game's going to have a bit of a learning curve to you it's much more along the lines of something like a Garega or right in where you're given lots of toys and you're expected to use them now how this plays into scoring I think is different so I think if you're going for scoring from what I can understand just looking at the score screens and stuff you do kind of want to play it like a cave style game where you're not doing bombing and stuff because I do think you get a bonus for not bombing and all that so I think on that regards, uh, learning the stage layouts and all that, it's going to be much more useful. But if you're going for the CC, uh, use these items and use them well because you get plenty of them and you can really get yourself out of a lot of tight situations and uh, speed kill things and all that good stuff. The last mechanic I want to talk about here are your fairies, which are like your homing slaves or your homing options, depending on which game, uh, which term you want to use. I think, I think they're referred to as slaves in this game, you know, kind of a homage to Raiden, I suppose. I think also, if you go once you clear the game, you go into options, you can actually play as the fairy, just like in Raiden where it's got a smaller hitbox and it's faster. I actually stuck with the witch because uh, the fairy's movement speed was a little bit faster than I was comfortable with in this game, though I might do another run with the fairies and stuff. I'm assuming the fairy is probably better than the witch once you get the hang of it. Though in this game, speed doesn't seem to be as big of as, it, as an issue as it is with something like Raiden, where you're, you are still doing a lot of bullet hell style gameplay. I think more traditional shmup players might struggle with this game a little bit more than they think if you're not used to bullet hells and all that sort of stuff. I'm not entirely sure about that, but it does have a lot of bullet hell elements to it and feels, this arrange feels like a bullet hell rather than, you know, something like the original Cotton, which... I don't mind. I enjoy and I do think arranges are meant to be different, right? That's the point of an arrange. That's why it exists, is to bring a new style of gameplay to a similar stage layout and all that sort of stuff. I think this arrange is above and beyond because it also, I believe, has 
extra bosses and enemies and all that sort of stuff which you don't really run into in most arranged modes so that's really cool as well this boss i think i know miss him here this guy isn't hard but he's very troll that's the way to put it where if you get caught in certain positions he's just gonna stomp you out with his hands or he's gonna jump onto you or if you don't know what he's gonna do he's gonna kill you a bunch because he'll just do a bunch of like random weird stuff that if you're not anticipating it it will just kill you like these jumps for instance for my first while playing I was like okay he'll just jump every time this you know rinse and repeat and then one time he doesn't jump he just runs forward and crashes into me and kills me so getting rid of hit getting rid of him fast is always a, a good idea um, I've unlocked tea time this is at the end of every stage I haven't talked about this yet so the way tea time works is kind of a fun little risk reward mini game where basically if you dodge all the teapots you end up getting a very big bonus at the end However, if you pick just one up, that bonus disappears. And so from that point, what you want to do is just collect as many as possible to salvage what points you can. So the way it sort of plays out for me is in the first three or four stages, I try and dodge them and get the, get the points. But as the stages progress, they fall faster and get much harder to dodge. So stage five, six, I think four or two as well. Um, that's when I'll just pick up the tea without trying to dodge it. So it's a fun little mini game they included. I, keep for, I kept forgetting it existed though, because it's kind of, you know, unique. Most shmups don't have a mini game at the end of the stage. So I'd like, during the run, I'd sit and start talking to chat, or I'd sort of look around, look at my phone, see if uh, chat was messaging me. And I kept forgetting to play the mini game. You do get a good amount of score off it though, so I think in this run I paid a little bit more attention, but some of the other runs I kept forgetting. So here we are in the final stage, essentially. There is a stage after this, but it's just a boss fight. It's one of those. This reminds me a lot of a Gradius stage. Um, you know, Gradius stages, this is like a hallmark of Gradius game design, where you have enemies kind of coming up from the top. This game actually has quite a bit of, in common with Gradius, too, because you have the whole bomb mechanic thing, where you have your shot, and then you also drop these bombs that attack the ground enemies, like in Gradius. And so a lot of the level design also reminds me in a similar way, where you have stuff coming up from the top here, then you have stuff on the bottom trying to flank you. The difference being is that since this is more bullet hell and you have much more screen coverage than you typically do in an old school shmup, um, it isn't very hard to cover the screen so that that effect diminishes somewhat. But there are a lot of moments where it feels like, oh, I'm playing a Gradius or an R-Type or something like that. So this mid boss here, at first I thought found to be pretty tricky. But then once you kind of find this little safe spot or semi safe spot, it's actually really, really easy just rinse and repeat what you do is you dodge that first uh, barrage of bullets then you fly up and then it drops these stalagmites I can't remember if it's a stalactite or stalagmite you know can't remember which points which they drop down from the center you just get back in the corner so you're just kind of flying in little counterclockwise motions it's actually very very easy once you get the hang of it initially I was flying in the middle of them for some reason that I'm not I assumed there'd be some sort of punishment for getting on the corner of the screen, but there isn't. So, um, yeah, there's a little bit of advice there. I'm all ferried up. I've got all the power-ups. Got a good amount of bombs. We're coming to the boss. I've look at my resources. I've got an absurd amount of resources. I remember uh, saying in the commentary at this point, if I die, you know, I, I'm stupid or something like that because, I mean, I just no missed the last boss last run. So. This was pretty much in the in the bag at this point. So the real question is, can I swag out and no miss the rest of the game? That's what I was going for here. You'll notice while I was talking about those dark purple crystals, here's one right here where my bullets just cannot get through that damn thing. You have to pick it up. You have no choice. And that is kind of the fun risk reward of the game. Oh, I end up taking a death there. Mostly because I think of that stupid dark purple crystal right in the way where you are forced to sort of come forward. Oh, this section here is really obnoxious. I recommend on this section not firing because your fire just gets in the way and you can't see what's going on. Um, and there aren't really enemies to dodge or to shoot there. So I think that's kind of a funny bit of game design. Here we come into the home stretch. If you're not fully powered up, these later stages are pretty rough. Again, kind of like playing a Gradius or an R-Type, something like that, where uh, deaths are a bit punished with uh, low power and stuff. But it's not nearly as bad as those games. You know, it's not that hard to repower up. 
and you do have lots of items typically you can rely on to use your magic to sort of cover you until you get there especially the blue shield so here we go boss fight when I originally played against this boss and wasn't using the magic and all that I thought this boss fight was this boss fight was incredibly difficult because it has some very very tough patterns to dodge because of just how fast they are but you know what I did here was I would just play and I'd have my you can see my arms up in the air my sprites arms up in the air that means I'm just sitting and charging my shield and the second they're about to hit me at that's when I release it and so it has a fun sort of magic has a fun mechanic where you hold it and charge it and then instead of pressing a button to activate it you release it that's what I was doing a lot sometimes I can bite you in the butt though because the buffering is a little bit funny at times where you'll hold it and it just doesn't charge or it seems like it's charged but it's not and you won't get the attack that you want but for the most part it works pretty well see there I dropped the the purple bomb right on top of him did a ton of damage almost there sitting on a shield and a fire so I basically can just uh, unload on him here and then we go into the final stage and final boss one more tea time you see I don't even try to dodge it I just go to the collect be impressive to see someone dodge these later tea times though this stage reminded me a ton of the uh, the stage in death smiles where you go down and fight the dragon at the end I mean that's why I think there's a lot of similarities between this and death smiles maybe death smiles got it from cotton or maybe the reboot got it from death smiles it's hard to say because I'm not familiar with the original cotton version all that much but I do think it's pretty fun and here we go the final boss the final boss once you kind of get the hang of her she really isn't too tough you just need to get the hang of how she works initially you're gonna have a tough time you're basically basically gonna spend the majority of the fight with your back up against this wall here when I originally played the game I was playing it on my CRT monitor and I sort of stretched it into a 4x3 because my CRT is not 16x9 and uh, that made this fight a lot harder because I didn't realize how much space was in the back here because it was so stretched you know um, so even if you are playing this on a CRT I recommend you sort of uh, put a letterbox or whatever whatever you do the, the black bars so you get the 16x9 aspect ratio otherwise uh, some of the sections of the game are gonna come off a little bit silly where you don't realize how much space you actually have now she goes into her second phase here of having these meteors fly at you and these sort of weird creatures Fe second phase isn't too bad as long as you sort of keep an eye on the meters or on the meteors and uh, don't worry too much about her attacks other than that dragon she summons that one you got to keep an eye out for this is a long fight by the way uh, taking a death there I only have five four more uh, lives interestingly though you don't respawn bombs and magic when you die so if you use up all your magic on the last boss here every time you respawn you're not getting more magic or anything so uh, it's a little bit like Musha or something like that where uh, you can get into some chain death situations if you're not careful luckily I've learned the boss fight enough to where even if I don't have magic I can still dodge a lot of the stuff here and do a good amount of damage halfway there so now we go into the third phase here or fourth phase third third phase where she starts dropping these meters for the most part you just can ignore a lot of them and uh, dodge on this back wall here but every now and again she'll have these meteors that cover the back wall and you have two different choices either you go forward a little bit and risk getting flown into or what I started doing I don't know if I do it in this run or not because I'm low on magic but what I started doing is just magicking through the uh, meteors just activating magic and then using the invul to fly through the meteors you can do that as well so here we go the final phase where she starts launching these slow drifting bullets they're actually not that hard to dodge I think the meteors are probably harder to dodge than these things though if you get cornered that that's not a good time so you have to be a bit more proactive here so close and there we are the 1cc that took me I think about two hours of effort yeah the time timestamp was about two hours it took two hours of, of streaming and then I practiced it about two hours earlier so that's about a four hour 1cc uh, very comfortable clear at the end though so I'm happy with that 
And with that being said, I definitely do recommend the mode. I think the mode would be really interesting to try for score. I didn't really try it for score, but I could see it being played for score being a lot of fun, being something like a Death Smiles meets a Crimson Clover somewhere in there. But anyway, thanks so much for tuning in, and uh, I'll sh end by giving shout outs to my patrons. Adios, everyone. So thank you to 72 PCT Water, Adam Pearson, Adrian Reyes, Ukshay Wadker, Dingo, Handicap, Anthony A, Ben, Ben Wynn, Borgie22, Brian Reboot, Brian Shiver, Corio, Danielle Savage, Delta Tango 6, Disco Star Slayer, Dominic NG, Eric H, Full Set, Retro Schmupper, Geriatric, Don Maku, Hausu, Ilya, Kiwi, JLab, JBRPG, Joe Angelo, Game Boy Guru, K, Malaise, Mark Toms, Maz, Meher Klendrian, Minong, Queen Charlene, Nathaniel Davis, N Electron, Nine, Okla Kukuls, Philip Mason, Portal 63, Ram Q, Raul, Real Skeen, Sketchy Raccoon, The Boot Rex, DRM, Zugumo, Plasmo, Yishi, and Yutakaya. Thanks for watching.